Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon and joining us to have this discussion around uh, disaster preparedness and recovery. My name is Reina Kaneko. I'm the president of Japan America Society of Hawaii, one of the hosts of this event, along with East West Center, where we are today, and the K. Donlin USA, and also the Consul General of Japan in Honolulu. Uh, we are very excited to be able to have this, this, this discussion with uh, subject matter experts um, in the field of disaster preparedness and recovery. At this time, I'd like to call up uh, Mr. Kiyoshi Tanigawa. He's the Executive Director of the K. Donlin USA to say a few words. Tanigawa-san. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, this is my second time to come to Hawaii, and I'm now feeling the warm welcome of this tour. <laughs> and um, I would like to thank the co-organizers, all the distinguished speakers and participants for making this event possible. Um, for those who are, who are unfamiliar with our name, um, Kaidan Ren, for more than 70 years, has been recognized and respected as a leading voice for Japanese business. We seek to establish consensus in the business community on a variety of important both domestic and international issues and work for their steady and prompt, prompt um, resolutions. One such issue is this today's theme, disaster preparedness and recovery. Um, as Matsudawa-san has mentioned, um, Hawaii is now experiencing its first um, eruption in 38 years on Mauna Loa um, volcano. And just like Hawaii, Japan is a beautiful island country, rich in nature, but it's also a country facing numerous natural disasters. Because of this geographic background, Japanese companies like TEPCO, NEC, and JR Central have accumulated excellent technology and a wealth of experience in this field. Needless to say, the U.S.-Japan relationship is the most important bilateral relationship for our country. Japanese companies have good corporate citizenship and have contributed to their local community. Same is true here in Hawaii. Today, I am um, excited to hear from the experts from both Hawaii and Japan of their cutting-edge technologies, countermeasures, and insights. I hope this seminar will help improve the resilience of Hawaii and strengthen mutual cooperation with Japan. Mahalo. Mahalo, Tanigawa-san, and thank you for coming all the way from Washington, D.C. to be here with us today. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce, um, and I think she probably doesn't need um, any introduction for most of you, um, our moderator for this panel discussion today. So just to set it up, we have um, panelists, panel one, and then we'll take a short break, and then we'll have um, set panel two. And then after that, we'll have a reception where you all can chit-chat and meet each other and, as we say in Hawaii, talk story. So, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome President Suzanne Varis lum of the East-West Center. Mahalo nui loa, Reina, or President Kaneko, and Council Matsuzawa, and Mr. Tanigawa. Thank you to the Japan American Society and K. Dandren, as well as the Consulate General of Japan's office. To bring us all together, and all of you who are here in our space, we welcome you to the East-West Center and those online. I can't imagine a more appropriate space to have here with the Japanese Garden, sponsored by many Japanese corporations, and here the Jefferson Hall that became the Imin Center because of the contributions of many Japanese organizations. A place that was established in 1960 when Eisenhower, President Eisenhower signed the authorization of the establishment of the East-West Center, that there needed to be a place that promotes understanding and relations among people and the nations of the United States, Asia, and the Pacific. So how appropriate that we would use this time with these distinguished panelists from the United States or here in Hawaii and Japan to talk about ways that we can build each other better. You know, we just finished our 
strategy at the East-West Center looking forward. And one of them is in convening impactful dialogues. And we just had the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation here with 21 Economies that just finished last week. And number one, climate. Whether we had the Pacific Island Conference of Leaders, number one, climate. The number one existential threat in the White House Indo-Pacific strategy is climate. And with climate, we're gonna see an increase in the number of natural disasters, there's no question. And I'm sure our panelists will touch upon that as well and how we're prepared and how we can exchange ideas. And at more this time more than ever, do we need to have this conversation today. So I am really proud to be able to introduce our set of distinguished panelists here. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna introduce them and then give them each a chance to share with you some perspectives from their background and then give you a chance to provide some questions and, and, and they'll provide some answers as well. So our first panelist to my right here is David, Mr. David Lopez and he is the executive officer of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, or HIEMA. He joined HIEMA in 2015 as the Hurricane Program Manager, which evolved into the Critical Systems and Logistics Planner. And he also served as the Interim Branch Chief with over 20 years of experience in the International Crisis Management. David has developed threat mitigation plans, response plans, and has responded to events ranging from hurricanes to aircraft disasters and terrorist incidents. Quite extensive. We're so happy to have you here, David. You. Next to him, we have Ta Mr. Taichi Imamura, who has been a manager of the Washington, D.C. office of Tokyo Electric Power Company Holdings, or TEPCO, since September 2021. He's responsible for researching T&D sector regulatory trends, marketing trends, and utility strategies in the United States. Since joining TEPCO in 2011, He's been involved in the design of underground transmission projects, overseas business strategies, and consulting for overseas electricity companies. It's an honor to have you coming all the way across the, across the world, halfway around the world, to here in Hawaii, so welcome. And also, Hawaii's own Yo uh, Kawanami is the director of customer energy resources operations at our own Hawaiian Electric. And with 10 years of service, Yo is responsible for the operationalization of customer-sided energy resource, such as batteries, to enhance grid reliability. So please give a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> so we're gonna start off with each have, have a presentation, a, a short presentation to share with you, and we'd like to start off here in Hawaii with David. Okay. Um, aloha and mahalo. This working here. A few technical difficulties. We'll we'll work that out in a minute. <laughs> it's like all disaster plans. Yeah. You can have a plan. <laughs> That's the recovery part. There we go. Oh, there we have it. I can just push. Which one? There we go. Okay. Here we go. We're ready to roll now. Okay. Yeah. So I'm David Lopez. I'm the executive officer for Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. And what I'm going to try and explain to you is how we see the state as far as vulnerabilities go. And I'm going to, what I'm going to try to do is use the, our critical systems as the example. And I'm going to speak to three of them in particular um, food and water our power um, sector or the fuel products, you know, and electricity. There we go. Can you hear me better? Good, okay. Um, and then transportation in particular, touching on the ports a little bit. And so that's how I'm gonna try to set everything up to, to let you under see or understand how we see the vulnerabilities. And we're gonna try and do it through the lens of these key factors. So we're gonna take a quick look at these, these critical systems through the logistics chain, through on-hand supplies, um, through the burn rates, um, getting us to critical points in these systems, and then how do we resupply them or bring them back online? And then hopefully from doing that, then we can, we can see where we sit vulnerability-wise. But first, we have to understand what we're up against with um, taking care of our population. So if you look in the bottom, uh, what would be your left, corner is 
some percentages for our vulnerable populations. And if you add those up, that we're pretty close to 50% of our population has some type of vulnerability that would probably call on the government to help them in an emergency or in exigent circumstances. And then if you look at the far right, it's the tourism is what I call our silent um, population because just about every 10 days, we have about 15% over our normal population circling or cycling through the, the islands in the form of tourists. And this is another large group of people who aren't pre prepared to be here um, in exigent circumstances for a long period of time that would probably, again, if something happens, be, be um, asking our assistance. And so we have quite a large population that, that would rely on our agencies to, to take care of them. So one of the first things we have to understand is that logistics system. We have a long, fragile, um, and complex logistics chain. In general, it takes about six to eight days to get things here from the mainland by sea. We're really good at moving um, passengers um, to Hawaii, but we're not so good at doing cargo. It's simply too, too expensive. So and when we think about emergencies and things like this, we're talking about logistics and bringing in a heavy load. And so cargo's, the cargo end of it is not as probably robust as we would like it, right? But it's probably not going to get any better than that. And then all things being said, even in the best of times, it can take as long as 14 days to get to the furthest end of our markets for any of these products. So, th you know, that's a considerable amount of time. When I was in Afghanistan, I got things faster than that. So what does that mean for us? Well, we talked about the complex chain, but... What it really means when we look at it is, is that, especially around the port of Honolulu, we don't have any resiliency or redundancy in our port capability. So it's a single point of failure, and that means that we can't replicate what the port of Honolulu can do in throughput in any other commercial port. So if we lose the port of Honolulu, we're, we're considerably at a loss with what we can bring in. And also when we think about where the Port of Honolulu is, it sits on the south shore, of course, of Oahu. And in saying 10, 15 miles of coastline, we have another port, Barber's Point. We have um, critical fuel, uh, one refinery, an offshore mooring point, food storage, fuel storage, uh, all kinds of things that are all in the same location, highly susceptible to the same threats. And all of these things that I just mentioned would affect the state directly or indirectly if, the, if they would be um, hit in a natural disaster. So that's another aspect of what we're up against that would affect our, our logistics portion. What does this mean for on-hand resources? And you'll notice up here it says on-hand resources. It doesn't say maximum. It doesn't say, it says operational capacities too. It's because we have an on-demand economy. And when we have an on-demand economy, it means no one fills up to the top. It's just simply too expensive. And for what that means in emergency management is that there's no emergency surplus. So within five to seven days of in our food and water, we can, we can be quickly depleted. And if we don't have uh, importation within five days, we're below 40% of our market capacity. And so you can see most of us who's been here a season or two knows that, that as soon as the alert goes up, then the shelves go dry, right? So that gives you an idea. Um, fuel is, is very similar. We have several single points of failure in the system. And foremost, we're 100% reliant on outside shipments of fuel, right? So if we lose the ability to ship, then, of course, we're suffering. Electricity, we don't have, um, we, we have what's called non-mutually supportive system. So I can't flip a switch in Oahu and, and turn on lights in Maui, okay? So all the systems have to come up on their own. Um, we have about 60% of our total power plants in, in, in or on inundation zones, so again, highly susceptible to the water and wind, wind threat. And um, just like every other major system, we're very limited in the in inventory of components. It's just hard to store things here. When we look at our ports, the biggest problem we have is that there's no large-scale salvage or dredging equipment. And it, if we had to order that out, in best-case scenario, it'd probably take about 10 days to get here. And that's probably pretty optimistic. We've got an alternate port concept, but again, it's not been fully realized, and it's the port of Hon or it's uh, Pearl Harbor, so it sits right in the same threat zone. So probably not ideal either. We're trying to do things to change that. But and then when we look at our airports, again, overall low low cargo capacity versus what we would actually need in emergency delivery. And if you think about start thinking about what happened in Puerto Rico, then this will start 
becoming come, come clear. So when we look at our burn rates, so what does it take to get to critical, right? Um, food and water within five days, like I said. We're, we're in critical. We have some um, emergency rations. That's probably up to about a million now, but that's with FEMA, and it can be used for the whole Pacific Rim, not just for Hawaii. So you can't quite always count on that. Fuel, like I was telling you, several single points of failure. So probably within 14 days, we would know where those inner island shortages are, and um, there would be some. Uh, electricity, critical levels on impact. Um, we'd have immediate loss in some cases, and probably fluctuating power throughout the state. We have a very, very large, what's called transfer and delivery system, which is your overhead power cables, almost 7,000 miles of that. So you can imagine what it's going to be like to run down the problems with that. Um, and so what's it take to bring things back? Um, food and water, we would be at what's called uh, hand-to-mouth resupply for about 30 or 40 days or until that port opens back up where we can resume that throughput. And what a hand-to-mouth resupply it means is that I'm going to bring things in and I'm going to deliver them just as fast as I can and then people are going to consume them probably just as fast too. So we're ba basically just keeping people alive. We're not sustaining for work and things like that. And that means that our restoration is going to slow down. Fuel, again, we're dependent on the port or the maritime trans fuel transport system to be able to operate. And um, so we would know very quickly what would be lost, um, contaminated or ruptured tanks and things like that. Remember also, too, these are all in critical areas, and ruptured tank means contamination, and it slows down your restoration and recovery. Electricity, again, the expectation of you know, circuits within the grid, not full restoration. And again, if we think back to, to Puerto Rico, then we're looking at six to eight m months without having you know, solid power. Um, the other thing with all of these systems, too, is that the, usually the more high-tech they are and with the big components probably means that those components aren't made in the United States. So you have to order out for all of that. And not, if we don't make it here, then we probably don't have the expertise to install or, or put it back together again. And so you have to marry the expertise with the part, get it all here, why nothing's working. So again, very difficult to do. In our ports, we could expect probably take from 19 to 21 days to get that dredging or salvage equipment in, and that's probably, that's probably pretty optimistic, to be honest. The idea would be to try to get to about 75% capacity in those first 30 days. Again, probably pretty optimistic. Um, Give you an idea, with, with airport restoration, H&L restores at about um, one runway every three days. So you can imagine right around day 12, we'd probably have an increase of, of air supply or air power, but that's not going to be enough to relieve the demands of every system that I just mentioned. And then finally, to put it kind of into perspective here, if we just take a quick look at the, the same the same systems, but what happened with Puerto Rico. So right away, they were at a hand-to-mouth resupply, and that lasted for a long time, over, over 42 days. Their fuel, no fuel for ground transportation. So again, same type, same type of issues we're going to run in. Electricity, aging infrastructure. Geographically, very, very similar to the way we're set up, where power's on one side of the island, goes over the Cordillera, and then it's down to the population. Very similar to the way we're set up here. So, um, again, a lot of things. They were out for six to eight months. Their ports, their ports um, although they didn't receive a lot of damage, but it did show us the same things that we expect, that port recovery is kind of this long, slow process, and you just don't do a few things and all of a sudden increase greatly your throughput. And then if you look over um, at the end of that, that last line, it says 1,000 meals. That's the average in the first... 12 days that were delivered through air power, okay? And um, that didn't go up very much over the course of the next 42. So it shows you right there that it's highly unlikely that air power is going to be a great bridge to what we need to do in, a, in an emergency. And if me telling you that doesn't, doesn't sell you, then this picture should because you can see from Honolulu to um, the West Coast, where our support is, and then equidistance from San Juan, you see the support that San Juan had, and we understand 
how hard it was for them to recover. And you see they have all of the top ports of South America, all of Central America, the Gulf Coast, the East Coast, all have access. And they have the, the, the modern transportation system of the United States with trailhead or railheads and interstate to move things to the ports. So it gives you a, a really good idea of what we're up against um, and how we see our vulnerabilities when we talk about natural disasters. So again, my name's David Lopez executive officer, and I'll be here the rest of the night. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate it for that very comprehensive look um, and examining what we have to look at in terms of the demographics, very insightful, and of course the distance, the challenge of distance and that supply chain, the unique vulnerabilities that we have here in Hawaii surrounded by ocean and this long, vast supply chain um, in order to um, address the needs but also you, in a very short time, pointed out all the key things that we need to look at, those vulnerabilities, so that we can address the mitigating factors and also how we're gonna approach recovery. So there are so many similarities, island space, island place, uh, the numbers that you mentioned that 50% would be vulnerable, um, Hawaii, Japan, there are similar uh, considerations when we look at the operating environment for Hawaii and Japan, but there are some unique differences. And so it's, it's, and the other piece though, what is similar is that energy, electricity is one of those things closely tracked that has a significant impact on healthcare services, uh, recovery response to get back to normalcy. So it is with great pleasure to have Ima Morrison here to talk more about uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company and, uh, and the perspective from Japan. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Taichi Mamura from Tokyo Electric Power Company. Uh, it's great honor to be here today. Uh, actually, this is um, second time to visit Hawaii. The first time was um, 80 years ago when I visit on honeymoon. So <laughs> Hawaii is a uh, very memorable uh, place. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, today, um, I would like to um, explain about TEP called Natural Disaster uh, Prevention Initiative and new initiative in light of uh, 2019 typhoon response. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, first, uh, let me give you an overview of TEPCO. Uh, there are uh, 10 electric uh, power company in Japan, and TEPCO is one of them. Our service area is about 10% of the uh, Japanese area, but um, our electric sales account about one third of um, all Japan. Since we uh, supply to the Tokyo Metropolitan, uh, that is uh, center of the Japanese economy. Uh, here is the TEPCO's basic uh, di disaster prevention policy. Uh, three uh, key concepts to be considered in disaster prevention. Uh, resident facilities, uh, mitigation of the impact, and promote recovery. Uh, based on these three uh, policy, we are implementing the initiative during normal operation and in the event of the disaster. Um, let me give you um, the approach of the uh, first policy, uh, resilient uh, facilities. Uh, here are some the, uh, example of countermeasure against earthquake. The, um, as uh, example of the uh, substation, um, since the uh, air circuit breaker with high center of gravity can be uh, shaken by the earthquake. Uh, gas uh, circuit breaker with low center of 
uh, gravity have been installed uh, uh, recently. Since the, um, some steel tower uh, may be affected by uh, liquid function, so um, con concrete pr pavement between the legs of the steel tower to prevent the uh, unequal displacement. Uh, here are some examples of the countermeasure against the flood. Uh, as example of substation, um, the countermeasure to be taken include installing the uh, retrain walls to prevent the water uh, intrusion, raising substation equipment to avoid the uh, um, flooding, and installing the water full uh, doors to prevent the water from entering the substation. Um, since it um, takes time, it okay. Um, <laughs> um, it uh, take many times to um, uh, implement the, this countermeasure. Uh, we are. Um, we are uh, introducing that um, temporary uh, countermeasure uh, to reduce our uh, daily flooding, as, as shown in the right picture. Uh, next, next is the um, approach of the uh, second policy, mitigating the impact of the disasters. Uh, this slide um, shows the overall network configuration. Our transmission line consists of two lines uh, along the uh, two route. So um, if accident occur in the one route, uh, one, uh, the other one line can uh, supply the power. In addition, uh, critical transmission system as a um, mesh uh, structure, as you can see the right uh, picture, so that even if the um, uh, accident occur in one of the transmission, um, the other um, line can supply the electricity. Sorry. <laughs> um, if the transmission line uh, system facility are damaged, um, it will take the time to restore the system and the uh, outage will expand. So we are forming facility that can um, continuously supply power even the event of the single accident. Uh, this slide shows the um, substation configuration. Uh, the substation is configured to multiplex the transmission and distribution uh, circuit by placing multiple uh, units of the same equipment. In the event of the accident, we can um, quickly isolate the um, accident point and restore power in the short period of time. As shown in the previous slide, the power network is monitored with facility, and the power network is monitored and controlled on the 24-hour loading the shift. In the event of the facility accident due to the disaster, the monitoring and control staff uh, quickly confirm the details of accident and localize the accident section via uh, remote control. In order to maintain a promote and accurate response in the disaster, uh, monitoring and control staff uh, regularly conduct the accident recovery training 
to um, be prepared on a daily basis. Uh, next is the approach of um, third policy, uh, promote recovery. For early um, restoration to disaster striking equipment, it is very important to um, cooperate with the uh, national government, local government, uh, security authority, and the other related authorities. Uh, TEPCO will dispatch the personnel to related organization to provide the information on status of uh, outage and um, restoration and obtain the information from them on the status of disaster damage or uh, critical, uh, critical um, facility. Um, such as the hospitals. Um, in order to promote re recovery from uh, disaster, our equipment and special uh, vehicle are deployed in advance. Um, such um, equipment and special uh, vehicle are uh, dis distributed to each region enable us to respond in the quickest manner. In addition to secure construction capacity in the event of the disaster, uh, we have established a support system with manufacturer and construction contractors and confirm in advance uh, that we can cooperate with recovery in the event of disaster. Ground and maritime uh, self-defense forces also support with um, transporting the equipment and personnel. We conduct uh, regular joint training and confirm matters of cooperation. Now I'd like to um, explain about the um, uh, case study of uh, Typhoon Faxai in 2019. The Typhoon Faxai was one of the most uh, powerful typhoon to hit the Tokyo area for years. As a result of the Typhoon Faxai, uh, severe supply issues occurred in Tokyo area. The maximum number of the customer power outage was about 935,000 household. The picture showed the damage in Chiba area uh, caused by uh, Faxai. In terms of um, constru uh, construction equipment, the two steel tower collapsed and in terms of distribution facilities, damage to uh, UTT pole and lines occurred um, over the uh, wide area. The charts show the trend in the number of outages on household as a result of Faxai. Uh, normally, uh, power would be destroyed in two or three days, but this time um, it took about 60 days to complete recovery. The delay in restoring power outage was due to the uh, time required to assess the total extent of the damage. One of the reasons for this was that Patrol personnel could not be allocated in accordance with the scale of the damage. In the aftermath of the FACSI, TEPCO has established a system that allows for the formation of up to 1,600 patrol team to assess the uh, total extent of the damage. 
In addition, uh, we use drone to assess the damage situation in inaccessible area. But due to lack of the, lack of the um, drone operator, um, it took time to respond to the situation. Therefore, um, we formed a specialized drone team to respond to the equipment damage. Um, until this time, uh, patrol personnel would ascertain the damage and report it to the head office after returning to the office from site. So it took time to collect the information. We have um, established an environment that allow real-time information sharing from the disaster site and have built a system that enable rapid planning of the recovery strategy and information sharing in with the head office. Um, learning lesson from Typhoon Faxai, we are implementing short-term measure without delay, but also working to implement medium-term measures as soon as possible. In the future, we will focus on the following three areas. The first is further strengthening and uh, collaboration with parties outside the company. Quick restoration from power outage requires not only the effort of our own company, but also the national government, local government, other electricity power companies. We need to strengthen our collaboration and take nationwide measures. The second is power failure recovery um, diversification. Recovery is based on the uh, major premise of the system restoration. But for area where long-term long equipment restoration work is expected, power generation vehicles are to be used. It is um, important to promotely supply emergency power using distributed power sources such as um, EV and other vehicles. Third, we will actively utilize and expand the scope of use for the latest technology. It is necessary to promote digitalization that contribute to disaster restoration, including in assessing damage condition in order to affect uh, quick restoration from power outage. That is for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Imamura-san, for that very comprehensive look. You know, we had David that talked about looking at the vulnerabilities, and now we heard from a Japan perspective on disaster prevention, how we do resiliency, redundancy. What really struck me were the very specific examples of investments, uh, countermeasures for earthquakes and floods, and the, the case study example of the Typhoon Foxy, and 934,000, I mean, that's almost our Hawaii population. So, I mean, <laughs> 1.4 million across the island, so pretty uh, amazing. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there's gonna be many more questions uh, on those details. So, like uh, energy is always top of mind for everyone, again, and in Hawaii, that's no different than Japan. So. It's really a pleasure to have you here to share with us from Hawaiian electric perspective. Thank you, Susie. Two observations. Uh, when you recognize high ranking officials in the audience, your anxiety goes up. And Raina, I think I need reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone for having us here. Uh, I would like to, like Susie mentioned, I would like to share a little bit about what Hawaiian electric does. Um, David covered the strategy, policy, and the technology was covered. What about the people? So today, I would like to share a little bit about how do we prepare for a uh, disaster. So, sorry, a little bit uh, sh if shifted, but let's see. Oh yeah, it is a little bit shifted, but um, 
it's all in the, the word itself, disaster preparedness. It's, it's all the activities we do pre-incident, before anything happens is what we need to focus on. And so whether that's employee training or having drills and exercises on what needs to be done and working with HAIMA to make sure we know how to collaborate and be ready to communicate because when disaster actually hits, it gets really chaotic. There's, there's no question about how chaotic things can be during that time. And then understanding how uh, information sharing could be done. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, let me kind of fix it. Oh, we lost. You can put it over there. It's, uh, actually, funny, it's, I cannot see close. I can see farther better. So <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with far. So, so thank you, everyone, for um, during the, you know, electoral service, thank you, electoral service restoration plan, again, what is, what is the, what are we planning towards? What are we training towards? And then the preparation that we go through is documented and it is a very boring document, to be honest with you, but it is very important that we have to be abiding by. And I'll share with you why that is. Um, we do use a, a federal standard called National Incident Management System. This is by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. And this is really important because the language cannot be just for Hawaiian Electric. There are, when a disaster hits, multiple organization involves border water supply, the state agency, the city county. We need to be able to use common languages here. So common framework. And when we make the temporary organization, that response is really critical. So having that national, federal level document really helps us. And this document is scalable. So if the incident is, no incident is smaller, but there is levels that we abide by. So it comes down to training, you know, compared to the two individuals here. I, I am not an expert in disaster preparedness by all means. However, the 2,500 Hawaiian Electric people, we're all emergency responders. We all have to respond when something happens. So we have to be trained and we have to remove our current hat. My day job is working with batteries and solar, but I will not be working on that during a disaster occurrence. So that employee responsibility is given to us and we are given a specific role when that disaster happens. And I think a lot of you, and including Hawaiian Electric, we've been seeing turnovers. People are retiring, people are coming in. We need to ensure that training is ensured so that the new people that have joined Hawaiian Electric is ready for these disasters. So we do, uh, we do monitor those updates through um, very frequent updates. And of course, Mauna Loa is a very good example of how we need to be prepared because you wake up one morning and an eruption happened, right? That's a hurricane. It's a little bit more predictable. You see it coming, but a uh, eruption that comes from first time in 38 years, those are a little bit difficult to predict. So what do we do? We set the objectives and these things are really timely in a certain way where you set the objectives you set the priorities and the time frame and an action of how to respond towards the disaster. Uh, one of the most difficult disaster preparation when we cr uh, brought up an incident management system was COVID. <laughs> when you look at the third bullet, the set the time frame, we had no idea what to set the time frame. Initially, we were setting IMT for 10 days at a time. Is this, because we didn't think it as a long term. We did not know how to respond because it was actually not in our booklet on how to deal with a pandemic. So this was a quite a learning experience for Hawaiian Electric to live with a pandemic and be able to utilize the incident management system to our advantage. Little hard to see, but Dave mentioned about how our islands are not interconnected. If Hawaii Island goes down, we cannot provide power from Maui and sent over. So, and if the disaster hits all islands at the same time, we need to have a cohesive training team together. So if you look at it, maybe you might be able to see it. Um, each individual island, there's a representation. They're getting the same message at the same time so that we can communicate accordingly and decide whether a particular island needs to be uh, monitored more uh, closely. For Mauna Loa's example, there was no IMT team on Oahu, but my teammate over on Kona had to be on IMT, so he would have to remove himself from 
his daily jobs reporting to me and report to this incident commander that's managing the Mauna Loa situation. And then, not, not to be rep too repetitive, but advanced training is key. It's very difficult to prepare for something that we don't know. And, and a lot of the bigger hurricanes that has hit Oahu is a little bit similar to Mauna Loa in a sense that the largest hurricane that hit us that really required a lot of attention hasn't happened in a lot of decades actually. So we lack in experience, real life experience to be prepared for that. So we wanna be over prepared with the people that actually has experienced an IMT on Oahu for hurricane and ex as an example. We do set, uh, we use the FEMA standard to set, thank you, the classification levels from level one through five on how bad it is. Dave mentioned our critical infrastructures are on the similar areas, so if there happens to be a strong wind or a tsunami that goes to the south shore west side, our power plants also happens to be on the west coast side, so th there's a linkage there where how do we respond accordingly when everything seems to be in the same location. One example that the state, Hawaiian Electric, and the military took initiative of was to build a power plant in middle of the island at Schofield Barracks. Uh, it doesn't solve everything, but it was certainly a big step forward for us to build the disaster preparedness just in case all the power plants on the west side uh, is not available for maybe days to come. So we have that contingency plan. Pre-incident preparation. Uh, we, this sometimes, if you know, wake up one morning and Mauna Loa is happening, this activity has to happen in hours. If it's a hurricane, we might have a few days, but it's about setting that right activation level on who needs to report to the incident management team and be able to provide the support and the communication of it. And some of the communication, you know, we, we live in the 21st century, but if, the, if we're not able to communicate with our teammates and unable to contact them, even that step one can be difficult. So. Uh, this, I was running a little bit late and Reyna didn't have my phone number. Th these things matter, right? The, it, it's in the little details that matters for us to be able to execute. So for me, it's important to know where my 10 people are living, do I have their phone numbers, and do I have a second option of communicating with them as uh, that phone might not be available. So pre-incident preparation, again, comes to our high priority. A uh, little bit about how do we go about restoring the power we, safety is first. We are not gonna go out there if there's still high winds or some uh, torrential rain. We will not go out there. We have to address that first. We'll have to conduct the damage that uh, the disaster has caused. And then step three, the large infrastructure comes first. So the power plants, the transmission lines, and the substations. So west side comes. And then the repair of the neighborhood circuits and we slowly gravitate towards getting all lights uh, to be turned on. So because our power plants are mostly on the west side, people that lives on the east side might be on the little bit on the lower end when it comes to the steps. It's close to probably five or six because we're focusing to get the power plants up in first and the neighborhood would slowly go from there. And that's our restoration plan. The utility, you know, electricity is a lifeline for all of us and we do have to help each other. So there's a mutual assistance membership. Hawaii and Alaska belongs to the Western side. So if there's a California need for personnel, uh, our members do go up to California or Washington, Idaho to provide support and vice versa. If we encounter a need, people will come in. But I have to remind, just like David said, if, they, if the port is not ready, if the airport is not ready, the mutual assistance may not necessarily come to fruition because they're not able to come to Hawaii. So those are all something that comes to our mind. I forgot to mention, um, I do have an engineering degree, but you will not see me putting up electric poles, so don't worry, you're, you're, you know, qualified people are doing the incident management team. We are all assigned roles that we can provide and train for, so that is an essential part of the IMT. Once the IMT is completed, disaster is passed, everything is fully restored, it's the perfect time to go through the demobilization, everyone goes back to their day job, and then we go through a in-depth after action 
review so we can take notes. Some of the documentation may have been not up to date because something else has happened. Uh, no one has a pager anymore. Whatever that may be, we have to update the document. And we have actually done that a couple of times. During my 10 years, we've had a couple INTs. Thankfully, Hawaii was protected, but uh, we did have some lessons learned where some of the phone numbers we did, we had four important vendors were no longer valid. And my last slide is, you know, again, this is from a few years ago. This is the number of hurricanes that was close to us. It's a telling story about how we need to be prepared and we'll do our best to restore the power. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for following up and, and really expanding what we already heard on how we look at the operating environment, how do we prepare ahead of time, and then, of course, um, how do we train in that preparation, looking at the people, and how do we do that in the United States by a common system, the Federal Incident Management System, and sharing, having shared priorities and time frames, so thank you so much for that. We. Um, are running short, so uh, I don't know, Reina, if we want to just take a group of questions and see if, um, since we started a little bit later, a couple of questions. Okay. So I saw a hand up here. Do we have a, I see a hand back there. Any, any questions for our panelists? I've done my job. Do we, do I can we go need home now. Online? Do we yeah. have a <laughs> <laughs> um, You used the Puerto Rico uh, case study as an example to learn from. I'm wondering um, the difference between Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Uh, Puerto Rico is a territory. Hawaii is a state. Hawaii has all the military bases and all the military facilities. Um, how much of that is an advantage for us? And also, would you say that maybe Puerto Rico, uh, the response was delayed because of political reasons? Uh, so, start with that one first. I'd say no. Um, you know, they, in the national incident management system, the way it's set up is that um, all all emergencies basically start and end at the local jurisdiction. So, the local jurisdiction has certain responsibilities it's supposed to do. Now, having said that, you know the. The federal government did step in and put a considerable amount of resources, um, like over over you know six seven thousand um, troops and federal employees to to take on the roles um, because the citizens there were weren't able to get to work. So they did over seven hundred airdrops because the roads weren't open. So they did a lot of things. So I, I don't really think that that was a biggest factor as maybe some people might think. Um, Let's see, uh, what else did you ask about? Um, the military presence, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, as far as the state, the state and the territory, really not, not too much of a difference there. Um, uh, the big thing is, is we, we work with the military and our military counterparts, and they've received my briefing um, in full, the, the whole two and a half, three hour briefing, so where we get really in deep, deep details. What you have to understand is that that port of Honolulu takes care of the military too. And our normal, say for food, um, you know, why Food Alliance, CNS, the big distributors, the same ones who go to, to Safeway and Costco, go to the commissary. So they're on the same program that, that we're on and they're well aware now. There's no, like everything else, there's no big surplus over there. Um, as far as the help and assistance, what most people don't realize is that, yeah, the military, um, and having been in the military, you know, they are very capable, but, but their job is not, it's to defend the country. It's not to respond um, to a local emergency in Hawaii. That doesn't mean they don't have capabilities, but you've got to remember that their capabilities spread out all over the world for the job of defending the country. So there's a, a different priority there. So although their capabilities might be in an essence based here. That doesn't mean that the assets are all located here. So we go through a process whenever we're working with them about what the mission is, the availability of the asset location, and how much time it takes to get here, and then decide whether we're, it's gonna be of use to us. So we, we work pretty good with them. Um, FEMA helps coordinate that when it reaches that type of level. 
we have their representatives liaison in our office, both at the federal and state level. So I think there is a, a good, a good healthy um, organization there, and, or or um, cooperation there. So. Thank you so much, David. So we'll go ahead and take one more question before we break in the back there. Aloha, gentlemen, thank you. I'm wondering about our grassroots plans. You know, you're all focused on infrastructure and the big deal things, but how are we doing with getting the public prepared, for example, in high-rise towers? Mm -hmm. Are we getting a lot of cooperation and is there a plan for that? Well, from, from the emergency management standpoint, so you, you know, in a broad sense, yes, there's, there's some plans for that, but each of those plans that you're talking about deal with, are from the county level. It's that the local jurisdiction starts with that. Um, so having said that, you would have each county, you'd have to go to their county to find out exactly what those lower level tactical plans are. For the state, yes, we, we talk about that. We do some outreach. We have some outreach programs. And of course, we have messaging and other things like that about prep, preparation and building your supplies and basically your, your resiliency in that manner. So. Similar with Hawaiian Electric, uh, with outreach, uh, we do messaging on our social media. And then whenever there are community events, uh, there's usually a Hawaiian Electric booth. And we're actually passing out hurricane preparedness booklets. Um, some of you may actually have it uh, that lists the type of food, clothing, batteries that uh, should be held very quickly and available. Now, to your question, how, how ready are the public? I, I'm not sure. I, I, that's, I, don't, I think I'm not ready, so uh, I need to do a better job there. I think it's hurricane season right now. It just ended. Just so, ended. Yeah, we, we made it safely through. All, there's also um, county, county training and county um, emergency response team. So there's different, and again, you know, each county is a little bit different. And on the state level, there are several. We, we have a, what's called a heart program, readiness program, that some communities have, have undergone. But it, and it's pretty robust, but it's, it's hard. In truth, it's hard to get volunteers and people to, you know, show up for these things. But yeah. Well, a lot of them will after a disaster, they're at home taking care of their own stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for that question, and thank you to our distinguished panelists. I appreciate it. I'm, they'll be here at the mixer, so if you have additional questions, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer one-on-one. -on -one. And we're going to take a quick five-minute break to reset, and uh, we'll call you back as we change out to our part two of our next group of panelists. So thank you again to our distinguished panelists.
The remote doesn't work. It remote. does. It, it does. does. It does. It should work. It should work. It should work. But um, as I, I mentioned, oh, oh, oh. this is the remote. And how do you it? Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. We'll go ahead and uh, if you could please uh, take your seats. We're going to get started for the part two of this very important dialogue on disaster preparedness and quick recovery in Hawaii and Japan, sharing best practices, coming together to improve our lives and the lives of our, our populations in both nations. So. I'm excited to introduce our next set of panelists of experts. We're very fortunate to have here so much experience in one place. Our first um, panelist is Carl Kim, Kim. He's a professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and director of the graduate program in disaster management and humanitarian assistance. He studies transportation, cities, and resilience. He also serves as executive director of the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center authorized by the U.S. Congress to develop and deliver FEMA-certified training courses for underserved, at-risk communities on natural hazards, mitigation, and urban planning. And next to him, we have uh, Mr. Na Naohisa Kitada. He is the general manager of the Washington, D.C. office of Central Japan Railway Company, or JR Central, which operates the high-speed rail with the world's largest transportation volume, Tokaido Shinkansen, lining Tokyo, linking Tokyo, Osaka, and 12 regional lines. 
And next to him, we have Mr. Bart Beavers. He is the Business Development Manager for NEC in Hawaii, an industry-leading provider of communications technology, AI analytics, digital ID, and integrator of IT solutions. In this role, he is responsible for development of NEC solutions in Hawaii that encompasses NEC's portfolio of companies, including NEC of America, NEC Labs of America, NEC X, and NEC Global. And then, last but not least, is Mark Yoda. He has been with the property and casualty insurance business both in the US and Japan for over 36 years and currently is the CEO of First Insurance Company of Hawaii L Limited and Mark is also the Managing Executive Officer of Tokyo Marine Holdings in Japan, overseeing Tokyo Marine entities in the Americas region. So please give a round of applause to our distinguished panelists. So first we're gonna start right here at home again. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Professor Carl Kim. Well, uh, good afternoon. You know, I was reminded just now that I've been an urban planning professor now for 38 years because I arrived in Hawaii when Mauna Loa first started uh, erupting. So my, my career has been uh, uh, closely tied to not just that eruption, but also the Kilauea eruption, which has been going uh, for, for many times. Um, you know, I'm really delighted to see you all here today and to talk for just a, a few minutes about what I think is really important for uh, disaster preparedness, response, and recovery uh, capabilities, and that is connecting communities. And I've been fortunate to work with many communities throughout the world including many colleagues and universities in Japan. In particular, we have a very robust partnership with uh, Tohoku University, with Keio University, with the United Nations University, much of it facilitated through the good work of uh, the East-West Center. So I'm really happy to uh, be here. What I want to do briefly today is talk about climate and other hazards but really the uneven impacts associated with them. And really the, the challenges in terms of equity and social justice that are created by uh, disasters. You know, technology is being proposed as a solution, but I think it does introduce other risks and hazards, which I wanna talk about. And then I think disasters are opportunities to learn, but what we really have to do is to work together and to find ways in which we can uh, collaborate. You know, last year, again, was a record-setting year in terms of weather and climate-related disasters, in terms of billion-dollar disasters. It's not just the hurricanes and flooding, but wildfires and heavy snowstorms and all kinds of other weather-related events. They're rapid onset, they're longer duration, they, they, they're repeating in the same places, and we talk about the three Ds, deaths, dollars, and disruption. They've all been increasing for two reasons. I mean, first, it's climate. The second is that people are moving into the red zone. It's our patterns of urbanization which is driving the increase in risk. And we saw that with the pandemic. You know, when a, a virus jumps from one species to another, it's all about the urban wildlife interface uh, and urbanization. The thing about the pandemic too, it really highlighted the uneven impacts of this disease, right? You know, certain sectors were really hit, the airlines, cruise ship industry, tourism, right? But also the service industry, you know, essential workers, the people who had to go to work, they were most at risk of catching the disease and, 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 uh, and, uh, and suffering from this. It also introduced many of the problems of supply chain management, the scary stuff that David was talking about. Uh, you know, it was all exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. And we have to remember that the older adults, uh, those with chronic conditions, the uninsured, those with inadequate health care, they really suffered the most. The other thing that the pandemic did, it showed a real digital divide. 
the people who had access to computers and technologies and jobs that allowed them to switch, you know, we're having trouble getting them back to school and getting them back to work again because they like working from home, right? Uh, but it also introduced a real division in society in terms of who has access to technology and capabilities and who can use this. And so I think that they're really vital lessons for response and recovery. For us, a lot of the stuff that we were trying to do to make cities greener, uh, more active transportation, uh, I think uh, that, was, that was a good thing that came out of the pandemic. You know, and so part of what we have been doing has been like strapping uh, video cameras into trees and using machine learning and machine vision to look at wave heights. We had to actually reprogram or re-engineer all of our technology for things like are people masking or are they keeping uh, social distance using the same machine vision, machine learning uh, algorithms. Another big project that we've been investing a lot in is using Google Street View cameras to capture the pre-disaster events and then we have the same equipment and then following Hurricane uh, Ian, following uh, uh, Ida, we send our teams in to capture imagery of the damaged area so that we can support the assessment of damage and, and, and help uh, the recovery. You know, so technology is a good thing. I mean, it, it can, but there are also other problems with it. There are real challenges. And we saw that. We worked on contact tracing applications. We figured out how to do this exposure notification stuff in a couple weeks. The biggest problem with all the issues about privacy, sensitivity, who, who can use this information, who can, that was, we still haven't figured that out, right? Uh, the technology was the easy part. So at the UN Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction in Bali this past year, we launched a research project on misinformation and disinformation for disasters, right? Because we rely upon good information. We, we've always been worried about accuracy and reliability and validity and how to manage and clean data. But we've never really had to deal with intentional disinformation people using social media and, and, and taking advantage of it. I mean, there's criminality, there's terrorism, there's profiteering. And so part of our research involves trying to understand this hazard and threat. And I think it's an ongoing threat. And many of us who do research, many of us who want to teach this in, or use this information, we really have to focus on this. So, so we have this uh, survey that we're doing. We're looking for best practices. If you're interested in this, this is something that we, we need to collaborate on. You know, surveillance has been a, a big topic, big interest of mine. You know, it goes back to Jeremy Bentham's work, uh, you know, where he was trying to optimize the location for, you know, basically prisons and schools. You know, if you, if you design structures so you know where people are and their movement on it, it influences their behavior. Right? And so a lot of the work uh, that I've studied earlier in my career, defensible spaces, you know, eyes on the street, you know, that's, that's changing because now everybody has video equipment, there's security systems, and there have been all these efforts to integrate data and systems on crime, on flooding, and, you know, all hazards. And, but the question is how, when, and for what purpose? And these are big questions that raise about accountability and trans, uh, transparency. I mean, do you really trust Twitter now and Facebook and all of these other? So these are real challenges that I think we face in a surveillance society. And this reminds us again of really the concerns about equity, fairness, and justice really the problems of both procedural justice but also horizontal and vertical uh, equity. And what we need to do is to focus on the needs of the at-risk populations, the minorities, the poor, those that are really uh, vulnerable, uh, both within communities and across uh, communities. And I think this applies to the challenges, uh, the concerns uh, between different countries across uh, the region uh, where we have to consider the redistribution of wealth, access, power, uh, and, and opportunity. And all of this is complicated with climate, urbanization, and development. And so what we need to do is multi-scalar adaptive learning. When we talk about resilience, we talk about three things. It's first the ability to absorb a shock. 
Second, it's to recover, recover quickly. But third, which I think is really important, is to learn so that you're better prepared for the next time a uh, hazard occurs. And the learning occurs just not in schools. It occurs in firms and agencies and communities and across various uh, disciplines and across all of these mission areas. And the most difficult work has to do with recovery. Uh, and so I think a lot of the work that we're trying to advance relates to research and education and training to mainstream resilience into continuous improvement. You know, there are some things we can do together. There's the upcoming PRIMO, the Pacific Risk Management OHANA meetings, which maybe some of you have participated in. It's our 20th year. It's coming up April 3rd through 6th in Honolulu. We bring together FEMA, NOAA, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, PAIMA, uh, all of our, our, our partners from Pacific Disaster Center, East West Center, others uh, to work on these issues. Our center does FEMA certified training courses and we deliver them for free uh, for agencies and we have more than 20 FEMA certified training classes. I'm also involved in an engagement on disaster risk reduction as part of the Quad Project, bringing together Japan, US, uh, Australia and India and I'm happy to talk about that. I think my time is about up. I'm trying to stick to the eight, eight minutes. I want to close, <laughs> close with this kind of existential threat. I took this picture of this uh, during the peak of the pandemic, you know, and there's no one there on the streets. And, and then this last slide is, is of my students on the volcano, kind of like Pompeii uh, in, in a certain way. But I think the way that we address these challenges is through integrated research, training, education, and engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. That was so comprehensive, and you really introduced some ideas that I don't think we always think about, is that social justice, but that has critical impacts on how, how long it will, we, or the, um, the, the um, re response, recovery, all of that is impacted by it, so thank you so much. And this idea also of trust and the role of technology, whether it's good or bad, so I appreciate that. I think that's definitely applicable, Hawaii, Japan, and all over the world, so thank you so much. Uh, next, I want to, we will travel on the JR Shinkansen all the way to Japan. And <laughs> excited to have um, uh, Kitada-san, who's going to share with us a very specific look at a very complex system, very critical system that connects, so um, over to you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Naofisa Kitada uh, from uh, Central Japan Railway, so-called JR Central. I'm uh, usually working in Washington, D.C., uh, where recently it is very cold. So I'm jealous about the Hawaiian climate and Hawaiian sunshine or Hawaiian breeze. But anyway, uh, I, uh, today I'm going to introduce our some efforts to protect uh, our passengers and our facilities and train uh, operation services from natural disaster. Uh, today, I have a lot of things to talk uh, in the, uh, within the 15 minutes. So I may speak so fast like high-speed rail, <laughs> so please <laughs> forgive me. I hope uh, it will be the informative for all of Hawaiians. Hawaiians. Before I jump into the today's agenda, let me talk about who we are. There are six regional passenger rail companies uh, like JR East, JR Central, JR West, so called JRs. And one nationwide JR freight company in Japan. All JRs were established through the, uh, the breakup and the privatization of the Japan National Railway, which was a, a national uh, governmental agency in 1987. We, JR Central, uh, is in charge of the uh, high-speed rail, uh, namely Tokaido Shinkansen, which uh, linked the Japan artery uh, between Tokyo and Osaka, which is the second largest city, and uh, 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 the beer Nagoya, uh, the third largest city in Japan, uh, and uh, 12 regional uh, conventional lines in addition. Anyway, the most of or 
the 90% of our revenue comes from the, this Tokaido Shinkansen, actually. This slide shows case of quality of Tokaido Shinkansen. There's no fatalities uh, since its own inauguration in 1964. And needless to say, it's very fast and green as a transportation mode compared to airplanes. And uh, punctuality is very, very high. Average delay per train is less than one minute every year, including the delay due to the natural disaster like super typhoon, snow, earthquake, and so on. This is related to today's agenda. We can say it shows one of products uh, or sort of achievement of our efforts. And we operate more than 300, sometimes 400 uh, trains per day. Moreover, what I wanted, I would like you to pay attention to is the number of passenger volume shown on the top left table. As you can see, we have over 400,000 passenger per day, passengers per day. This is overwhelming compared with other busy transportation services in the world. This means our operational performance has a huge impact. In other words, we not only support Japan's economic activities, but also have the lives and schedules of the overwhelming number of passengers on our hands. This is why we must protect them from any risks, even national disasters, and at the same time, we must maintain our train operations safely and stably as much as possible. <laughs> the largest risk we recognize among all kinds of national disasters is earthquake. Unfortunately, it is unpredictable and undetectable in terms of the timing and schedule, uh, scale. So we should be prepared in case whenever it happens. As you can see on the right, Japan has a lot of large scale of earthquakes. The pictures on the left shows, uh, show impacts and damages rendered by the large scale of earthquakes this 30 years on Shinkansen facilities of JR East and JR West, actually. Geographically, Japan is uh, surrounded by the earthquake risk, especially JR Central's operation area is facing with the, the area where the possibility of magnitude eight class in next 30 years is ex expected by experts to be 80 percent. In addition, what we have to consider as highly important things are first, our infrastructure is very, very old. And second, high-speed rail cannot stop immediately. Under these recognitions, we have been making mainly three efforts. First is retrofitting for almost all of columns of elevated tracks. This is done by jacketing or wrapping steel plates around each crumbs, and it is resilient against the Kobe crust, uh, which is uh, around the uh, magnitude 9.07, uh, 9.9, .9, sorry, 6.9 or 7 crust uh, seismic energy, which destroyed many bidirect crumbs, actually. Second is uh, terrace detectors. TERAS stand for the Tokaido Shinkansen Earthquake Rapid Alarm System. Seismic wave normally consists of two waves, so-called P wave, primary wave, and S wave, secondary wave. Once an earthquake happens, P wave arrives earlier than S wave by several seconds. As soon as a uh, as soon as a terrace uh, sensor detects a certain level of P wave, it would issue instructions instantly to shut down the power lines 
in order to stop all trains in the near area because train take time and trains take time and distance to stop as i mentioned reducing train speed as much as possible by applying brake before actual shaking uh, happens is very effective to minimize the train accident. Cell is a derailment, uh, cell is a derailment prevent gas. <coughs> this countermeasure was developed and brushed up for a long time based on our researches of movement of train bodies impacted by seismic energy. It can make train physically stay on the rail even if a large scale of earthquake, earthquake hit the train. These gas have already, uh, already been installed on the rail in the area which have high risk of large scale of earthquake. At the same time, deviation prevention stoppers are installed on board as a set with the guard, which prevent train cars from uh, turning away from the rail or falling over even if train cars get delayed. Other than earthquake, there are a variety of inclement weather in Japan, like super typhoons, mud strides, flooded, flooded waters, in summer mainly, and heavy snow in water, uh, in winter. However, those weathers are normally predictable to some extent through a lot of sources or forecasts in the most cases. We have been taking two engineering approaches to enhance the readiness towards incremental weathers one is uh, to improve infrastructure by stress strengthening physically the facilities against the damage due to water or snow. For example, installing drainage pipes inside the embankment and covering the slopes with concrete to protect from water penetrations. And uh, sprinklers has already installed in the heavy snow area uh, to, you know, uh, make the snow on the ground. Another approach is the scientific, uh, scientific one. We gather information from a lot of rain gauge and expand MP radars and animometers along the, our railway lines and constantly monitor and analyze many kinds of data like total volume of rain or hourly, uh, hourly volume of rain and wind speed and so on and forth, so forth, and apply threshold to judge whether we should keep or suspend train operation based on the academic theories and uh, experience in the past. Recently, we nearly adapt the analysis of the amount of rainwater stored in the soils for a threshold in order to protect trains from ground uh, displacement or mud strides. Operational wise, we have been making a lot of efforts to uh, efforts within all level in the company to always enhance our readiness. Preparing for crisis situation, we establish control headquarters within the top management level to share updated situation and make, it, make critical decision quickly and in timely manner. And we hold a training session for the top management level periodically. In the field level, we have variety of simulating drills and trainings for emergency situations by using actual train cars and facilities. In addition, as a redundancy system, we established the Shinkansen Second General Control Center in Osaka, preparing for the event when the current General Control Center in Tokyo is unfunctional. Also, as a training, we control, center, uh, we control the trains from the uh, Second Control Center periodically as well. 
to maintain operational readiness and employees skill, skills, those drills and tra uh, trainings in simulated situation are super, super important. This is because human beings could do nothing but what we have experienced or trained before, especially in the emergency situation. That is a big lesson learned from the experience in the past. On the tail of my presentation, I would like to introduce our ultimate redundancy countermeasure project, so-called Chuo Shinkansen project. The project is to construct another Shinkansen line from Tokyo to Osaka via Nagoya through mountain area where the risk of large scale of earthquake is expected uh, relatively small. At the same time, we plan to utilize the superconducting conduct magnetic levitation system, which enables train to increase the maximum speed to 311 miles per hour. Now, the construction work has already started between Tokyo and uh, Nagoya as a first phase. For just for this phase, we estimate the construction cost will be $50, $50 billion, and the commercial operation is expected to start as early as possible in or after 2027. As I mentioned earlier, our operation area is facing with a high possibility of the earthquake, uh, the huge earthquake within next 30 years, once Tokaido Shinkansen is shredded by the quake for a long time, we would lose our cash cow. And at the same time, the impact on Japan would be so critical because, again, the area is the center of Japan's economy. Therefore, the project has a huge meaning not only for our company, but also or more, more importantly, for our country. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much to your, to your attention. Thank you so much, Kikada-san, and sharing that one very specific example of extensive work being done that re reinforcing this preparation and redundancy and reinforcement um, and crisis management and training, all those things that we discussed earlier in this one very important example. And next, we'd like to um, call upon Mr. Bart Beavers to share with us from NEC Hawaii. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Bart Beavers. I'm the business development manager for NEC in the US or in Hawaii. Um, and I represent all the different NEC technologies that we work with globally. Um, so for disaster preparedness, we have uh, a couple of different technologies. Oops, sorry, it's the wrong way. This is upside down, that's why. <laughs> um, quick overview of NEC. Um, NEC was founded in 1899, so it's a 123-year-old technology company. Um, we work from, from the ocean floor to outer space. So we do undersea cables uh, connecting islands and continents to satellites and satellite tracking systems in outer space. Um, in Hawaii, the goal of NEC, our um, NEC of America CEO, Mark Ikeno, he wants to help develop a sustainable Hawaii leveraging NEC technologies. So we're working with many different groups using facial recognition for homelessness. We did the thermal cameras and facial recognition at the airports for COVID, and we're working in a lot of different areas, including in disaster preparedness. Can I skip a slide? Okay. Um, for NEC in Japan, um, there's the vision of the digital garden city nation, and being able to connect different layers of the community and into uh, a structure that can be helped manage in different situations. So infrastructure and data platforms are the areas that NEC is really good at, but the digital services that connect the community back through the, the data that's used in the infrastructure and the data platforms, how we can improve lives of the, the citizens of the islands. 
in, in particular in the disaster preparedness area, in Japan, NEC has been working with a couple of cities and our NEC uh, Smart City OS, which is a platform that connects different sensors with machine learning to be able to um, follow and monitor management systems. Um, in the, the difference of what we're talking about here is there's a middleware piece um, called Fiware that's been developed and it's an open source platform that NEC has created our own version of this that allows many different systems and communities to share data with each other. So if in Japan there's three different cities that all operate and they share their data together in disaster situations. So because they're next door to each other, and there'll be a slide here, that they share what the water levels are, the road conditions and all this. So folks in disaster management will be able to see a much larger picture bringing data in from a lot of different organizations that may not be just government but private agencies. And natural disasters in Japan match a lot of that in Hawaii with um, everything from volcanoes, landslides to hurricanes, tsunamis. Um, so there's a lot of what they do in Japan that could easily be brought to Hawaii and applicable. Um, in the particular uh, Japan, sorry, it's hard to see that. Um, this situation, we were connecting IoT data from different organizations that can talk about traffic conditions, weather, uh, water, and ocean conditions. And a lot of these are independent disparate systems that are brought together through the middleware fireware application and the data exchange program that now can be added or brought together to create a better, more fulfilled picture of what's going on for the management of the disaster, for David Lopez or other people to have a better situational awareness of what's happening at each area. Sorry. And then one of the ways, there's different sub-applications. So for instance, NEC is working on smart road, smart intersection technologies that would feed into this type of, um, excuse me, overall picture of what's going on. So these different sub-solutions feed into the FIWARE platform, then you can create a command and control of many different systems you know, that can be turned off and on based on the situation on the ground. And this is um, in the Japan area, how during the disaster situation, they were able to share data real time across three cities to be able to watch flooding situations, which roads were usable, which roads were not passable, and then be able to share that with the citizens on here's where if you need to evacuate, here's where you would evacuate in your space. Um, and so disaster situations, you know, there's a lot of different systems. So for instance, this is um, the road, uh, smart road, smart intersection system that is used on day to day for traffic management and safety. But in a disaster situation, you can now bring this data into the disaster management teams to be able to see is there water on the road, is there debris. We also have other technologies like a new technology called fiber sensing where fiber cable along a road would be able to be used as the uh, vibration and temperature sensor. So to be able to give you accurate information about areas that may not have camera coverage. So it's a newer thing that feeds into the system. So this is um, one of the smart intersection systems that we're doing that could feed into a larger uh, disaster management platform. So you're looking at you know, private 5G working in a small area with video analytics, but that analytics could have disaster situations, flooding, accidents, you know, debris in the road that would be highlighted and shared with the appropriate agencies. Um, and this is just a little bit more about what NEC is. We do a lot in Hawaii, the fiber optic cables between inner islands and then trans-Asia um, fiber optic cables. 
Uh, we're one of the three in the world. We do up to you know, 500 terabits per second, so we're really leading on that edge. And then the research of other uses of that fiber optic technology for uh, situational awareness. And, sorry. And that's it for today. Thank you so much, Bart. <laughs> Appreciate it. So next we have um, Mark, who's going to share from a perspective of um, insurance, the concept of insurance. We've had a lot of different perspectives here, um, you know, looking at social justice to very specific JRL, and then uh, looking at solutions for technology um, and how we can use it to detect and respond and prevent. And now this other aspect that's very critical when we talk about uh, re response and recovery. So over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Susie. And uh, I'm Mark Kiyoda. I'm re representing First Insurance Company of Hawaii, uh, which we have a history of 111 years here in Hawaii. And our parent is Tokyo Marine, the Japanese insurance company, having 143 years of the history. That means both company has come through 100 years and has come through a lot of those natural disasters. So, not only Tokyo Marine, but the insurance industry, we always talk about our mission. The mission is to be there for our customers and the community in the time of the needs. In the time of the needs, which means we feel in those serious situations, and natural cat catastrophic disasters are one of them. And in Japan, as you know, earthquakes, typhoons, also here in uh, Hawaii, it's about hurricanes, and tsunami, those, those things we experienced. And our mission has been to be there for the customers. And obviously it's insurance, so we do the payout of the claims. But at the same time, we have been always thinking, is that good enough? The insurance company paying the claim, is that good enough? So we are always thinking about what kind of the broader roles that we can take. So today, I would like to talk about the most recent solutions that insurance companies are working, which are both taking place here in Hawaii and also in Japan. Okay. I'm gonna use just two slides, and hopefully with two slides, you'll be able to sense uh, the shift of the social roles that insurance companies are taking. So what you see here in this slide is the stage of how we respond to the NATCAT event. And this is a very practical approach, very standard approach, how risk management is taught in the school. And today I saw both the TEPCO and Hawaiian Electric has taken the similar approach of how to respond in the disaster situation. So starting from the left side, it starts from identifying the risk and how we quantify the risk. And then we consider the prevention or how we can minimize, mitigate the risks. That includes some insurance protection as well. And then think of the action plan to respond and eventually to work on the recovery. As I mentioned, insurance has worked to act as to hedge the risk or to minimize the risks whenever this event occurs by paying the claims. And it is indeed, it's an important role. But again, it was quite natural for us. How can we take a broader role in these stages? So I'll just go briefly from the uh, left-hand side. You see those initiatives down in the blue. So um, the first thing is how we can participate in providing the information. And it, obviously there is information insurance the company retains and there are general information we can collect from our partners. It is about how we're gonna share that with our community, our with customers. One of the example is that if we are to talk about this risk or hazard, creating a kind of hazard map in your local town and how we share with the people. One of the initiatives that is taking place is, as an example in Japan, is that it, it could be seen as kind of CSR activities, but we reach out to the schools. We go out to the classrooms and we explain to the students, this is your town, this is your city, this is your area where you live, and these are the hazards that might take place. For example, is a flood. If there's gonna be the flood situations, 
these are the areas where you should never get close to those kinds of people. As you know, Japanese students, they don't take school bus, they walk. So it's quite important to tell them where, where is the dangerous area in your community to be careful in those kinds of situations. So those are kind of the rules we are starting to take. Um, the other issues that is mentioned here is we, always, we also support how we quantify the amount of the risks. We also do a kind of scenario-based consulting in the extreme case. The extreme case means it's hard to quantify the risks. And one of the risks that we are taking is what happens if there's eruption in Mount Fuji. It's an extreme case. But we do consult with mainly with the manufacturers, the suppliers, the, those kind of things. What could be the scenario in such in the case? Also, we are recently working on some of these digital technology sites. It says the usage of AR for simulated experience. Now, what is AR? I asked, what is the best way to explain AR? It's the world of Pokemon, Pokemon Go. <laughs> See? So you have these cell phones, and you go into this. It will show you your, your town, your city, actual streets. And then it will also display what will happen in this flood situation. You'll, you'll see how quickly flood will come in, how high it is going to come in, and it will clearly show the, the, the impact to, to yourself. So those kind of the things are now being utilized to educate and to share the information uh, with the community. Now moving to the prevention stage, this is a typical approach that we work with the, uh, our clients, the commercial clients or the community to work on the BCP type of things. Uh, BCP, the large company are very good in making this, but like the small, mid to small type of the customers, they clearly need support. So insurance companies are reaching out to create the BCP plan for our customers. Now, the third thing, reacting upon event. Um, this is one of the examples, but we recently partnered with the vendor to provide this natural cat alert dashboard. And what, what this is, is that they want to, one, provide the most recent uh, real-time situation of the natural cat disaster. For example, typhoon. How the typhoon is approaching to your region, how strong it is, what could be the potential damage to your region. And in the meantime, we also work before this um, disaster as a kind of pre-work talking about this action plan. So when, what will be the trigger to do the evacuation plan? What will be the trigger to, like there are many, many plans. So we'll go on this real-time information and match with the plan, and that will tell you that it's time to evacuate or those kind of things. So we provide those kind of the tools uh, to our customers. Now, getting into the recovery stage, um, there should be many efforts to be done. Um, one, we also partner with many vendors who work on the property restoration services. Um, just like y we saw the hurricane going to uh, Florida on Ian, and they're just on the recovery stage. And there are is many vendors working to do the restoration after the, uh, the, when the water comes in. And just not just simply doing the extraction of the water, but how you prevent the molds afterwards. Those kind of the service could be provided uh, to our customers. The, so just not making a payout of the money, but how we can provide the actual service to recover. That's the area where, where we want to be involved. And in addition to that, obviously we will not forget about our mission of this payout of the claims, but we're trying to seek how we can efficiently make a payment as quickly as possible. As you know, it often takes time to do the assessment and those kind of things. Where we are utilizing technologies. In, in this case, um, we, are think we are already utilizing the drones and satellite type of things. Uh, and I think there was a comment about this use of the privacy or those kind of things, but it's about the satellite can easily detect how deep the water came in or those kind of things. So it will be easy for us to assess how the, damage, the flood damage has been caused to the community. So those kind of things has been implemented uh, in our industry. Now, that is where we are now. I'd like to talk a little bit about where are we going and how we are going to work. And this is a kind of the new product, I may say, to talk about uh, the insurance. 
And let me start from the right-hand side as an example of Hawaii, what we have been doing in Hawaii. So um, First Insurance of Hawaii, we have this product called First Track, and which is different from the traditional insurance works. So how it works is that the payment will be based on predetermined two factors. So in simple words, it's how close the hurricane comes and how strong that was. So just as an example, if you apply for 10,000 college in Honolulu, and if category five hurricane hits, you're gonna get the full payment of $10,000. And depending on how far it came or how weak it was, you get a partial payment of that. But the advantage of this is that it does not require actual damage to your property. And that means we are not gonna make any physical assessment of your damage. We just pay out depending on this outcome of how strong and how close the hurricane came. So that's, that's the concept of this new insurance. So um, it, it, we're, not, we're not intending to cover the full amount. We still have those full hurricane coverage through the traditional insurance. But as I mentioned, those will take time to do those assessments of those kind of things. In the meantime, we know that if those kind of events are approaching, we'll make kind of the reaction to, just to mention, you go to the stores, you empty the shelf, those kind of things, but you, you'll be prepared for, to do those kind of things. And that requires some kind of things. If you have to do evacuation, you have to take an action on that. So those kind of the, the cost for the quick payment type of things could be done. Or the traditional hurricane coverage have deductibles. So it does not pay from the first dollar of the damage. You can fund by using this kind of product. So this, this is a kind of product we have already launched here in Hawaii. But this is not something unique here in Hawaii. We have always doing the similar things in Japan, which I'll talk about on the left-hand side. So in Japan's case, it is the earthquake. There is a similar product to be prepared for the earthquake. And again, it's a simple thing. How, to, how strong that um, the, the earthquake came in on this kind of the um, systematic intensity. Now, the, the concept in Japan is getting a little bit ahead of us by partnering with Amazon in this case. Now, this insurance, you can buy through the Amazon site. And if the event happens, and you can just uh, seek for the payment quickly, and the payment is going to be done by Amazon gift card, of course, on the digital basis. So you will quickly receive the Amazon, and if the logistic limit remains intact, you can order those supplies, what you ever need, through the Amazon type of things. So th this is a kind of a twist, and uh, it might be better if you say you don't need Amazon, but, but whatever. Um, there is kind, kind of new concepts coming in, how we can work um, much more closely to the client and to work on the kind of those immediate needs type of things. But the last thing I'm going to talk about is the left-hand corner down below. It's, it's about a demonstration experience in Takamatsu City. Bot just explained about NEC initiatives in Takamatsu City. And Tokyo Marine is also the partner of Takamatsu City working with NEC in that area, how we can work on these disaster situations. So it, it just illustrated there that um, what we have done on this experiment is that we ask for the participants, volunteers, to participate on this evacuation experiment. And as Bart mentioned, the technology could be used to send out an alert, it's time to evacuate. The important thing is that we don't want the people to be left over. We want to make sure that everyone will take an action. How can we do that? That's the purpose of this uh, experiment. So the test was that we, we thought it, that it, we sent out the email that, that trigger. There's a trigger that now it's time to evacuate. We'll send out those uh, notification to uh, the participants. And we are monitoring what is the activities they are taking to evacuate. And just to incentivize them, we are telling them that 
you can spend whatever cost you may incur. Don't hesitate. You have to evacuate. If you want to evacuate to the hotel, go to the hotel. It incurs cost, but don't care about it. If you want to take the taxi to somewhere, you take the taxi. Whatever, whatever cost you may incur, that's fine, but evacuate. That's the priority. And see how the people respond to that. And eventually, this insurance payment, the virtual payment type of things, we, we're using that. So after, after the, those uh, experience, they get a pay with, through this parametric insurance. So there's nothing we, we just tell them that it should, it's gonna be paid by virtually, it's not Amazon card, but it's a, it will be paid uh, on a kind of the virtual currency. But we have been combining these things. Again, this is not to cover the full coverage of the damage. It's about how insurance could work in this entire framework of the disaster uh, resilience type of the things. So uh, this, this is gonna be the end of my presentation, but it's not just us, the insurance company. We're not doing this by ourselves. We're starting to work with our consortiums, the business partners, the munis, just like NEC is working. And I think that's the kind of the new role that we are taking, that we're not just paying out the claims, but how we can participate in this the entire framework. So that is, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. That's fascinating. Fascinating on the shifting role of insurance in our lives and um, the role of technology in this predetermined uh, first track. Um, thank you for enlightening us about what you are doing in the insurance world. Uh, we are at time right now. So, um, I anyone have a pressing question? If not, there is a social hour right after this, which you know you're welcome, of course, to address our, our distinguished panelists. But if there are any qu pressing questions, we certainly want to take it right now. Well, we do. Oh, Steve, again. Steve, wonderful. Have you seen our rail that we're building right now? <laughs> we're, we're probably not going to spend $50 billion, but we're going to come very close to it. Uh, but um, we're not prone to earthquakes, but we're definitely prone to hurricanes and possibly tsunamis. So I hope while you're here, you will inspect our rail and let us know if we're doing it correctly. Yeah. Right, uh, but I guess that's not a question, sorry. Oh, it's a statement. Okay, well, thank you, Steve, for yeah. that statement. It's a kind of a business sales for us. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you to our panelists again uh, from the first sec session and the second session, and for all of you being here. Um, I, I want to turn it over to Raina if you have any closing remarks. Um, Oh, Alex. turn it over to Alex. Thank you. Um, I'm Alex Jampel, the chair of the Japan American Society of Hawaii. I'm glad all of you were able to attend today's seminar. Thank you very much for the panelists, and thank you, Suzanne, for moderating this uh, seminar. Um, and also, want a big thanks to Kei Danren, uh, the Council General of Japan in Honolulu, and the East West Center for making this happen and for supporting this event. Um, we're, we're kind of out of time and I'm sure you're all waiting to go to the reception. I think there's some uh, water and some instant noodles waiting for you. So please uh, go ahead and, uh, and once again, thank you very much for attending. <laughs>